Hi, everyone. My name is Andrea Vicari. I'm with Freeport MacMoran. I'm Director of Responsible Production Frameworks and Sustainability. Really, really glad to be here today um, in, I think, your midday, <laughs> my late evening, a day before, um, to talk a little bit about what we're doing at Freeport MacMoran um, to reduce carbon emissions from, from our operations globally. Um, a little bit about me, I've been in the mining industry for, um, I think this is my 23rd year, something like that, um, for a few decades, um, mostly in sustainability and operational roles. Um, and I also, um, I've, I worked in my past with Rio Tinto, with the International Copper Association, um, and now with Freeport. Um, really, my very first job out of university was in sustainability. Um, so I'm, I'm really just glad to be here today to talk with you a little bit about how we're accelerating things with regard to, to climate change. I didn't actually include, you know, a nice overview slide on Freeport, and I, I think I probably should have. So I'll just give you a little bit before I dive into our responsible production approach. Um, I'll give you a little bit about Freeport if you're not familiar, um, although I, our last speaker, I think, gave you a little bit of an overview um, of our assets. We are um, a global, very large scale copper producer. Um, we operate large, long lived assets that are copper. Um, in nature, we also have two primary molybdenum mines in Colorado in the United States of America. Um, and the downstream associations associated with producing uh, refined or basically a, um, an oxide version of molybdenum products. Um, we own and operate Atlantic Copper, which is a, a smelter refinery in, in Spain. In the United States, we have very large assets that you may have heard of, like Morenci, which is a very large uh, operation. In South America, in El, um, Chile, we have Alabra. And then, which is a, a really neat operation, actually up at very high altitude, um, and is an SXEW operation. And then down in Peru, we operate Cerro Verde, um, which is a very large, very large scale operation as well. And then, of course, not to be missed from uh, your side of the world is PTFI, so our Grassberg operation, which is in um, on the island of Papua, uh, Indonesia. And we're working on uh, building a new smelter in Manure in, on Surabaya in Indonesia. And we're expanding an existing smelter that's already there called Gresik. Um, and we will take operational control of, of that and then also start operating Manure in the next few years. Um, so we're very large uh, on any given day. We can be seven to 10% of, of the copper market. Um, and so we take these things very seriously, responsible production and ESG. Um, you know, we certainly would echo um, the sentiment that a company that does a good job of identifying and then managing ESG risk is, is you know, a company that is a more stable, less, you know, more risk averse organization. It's a good investment. And we believe that being a responsible producer, which essentially means taking all of those aspects of ESG or sustainability, as many of us know it, and integrating them into our everyday decision making. Um, so what you see here is, is our approach, you know, the three common pillars of sustainability, of course, people, environment, and governance, and then the many topics um, that we uh, deal with under each of those pillars every day. But ultimately, everything we do is, is underpinned by five values. Those are safety, respect, integrity, excellence, and commitment. And honestly, I will say that respect right now is paramount across the whole mining industry. Um, many of you will know that, you know, there have been some challenges in the last year with reports that have come out externally about, um, you know, cultural issues in the mining industry and really the whole rise of, um, you know, inclusion and diversity in the industry um, has led to many companies across the industry to really sit back and really put respect at the forefront um, and respect for human rights at the forefront. So we believe that be, by being a, a responsible copper producer, you know, ultimately we will contribute significantly to this transition that we're going through. Um, you know, I think we feel very strongly that although these are things that we've always done, uh, you know, we've, uh, we were a founding member of ICMM, 
we were a part of creating the copper mark when it was initially created um you know the voluntary principles on security and human rights you know we've been doing these things for many years there has never been more of a need to really demonstrate externally transparently how we're doing that whether that is about identification of risk management of risk um, and then ultimately being resilient over time so our, our ESG and sustainability strategy is aligned with international best practices. What does that mean? It means that we're you know, a member of the International Council on Mining and, and Metals. Uh, we belong to leading industry associations. We are committed to EITI. We've been a part of that since the beginning. Voluntary principles on security and human rights. We're committed to implementing an ongoing improvement with the UNGP, which is the United, United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. Um, you know, and then obviously many more. We report more than ever before. Um, our, our annual sustainability report this year was, I think, 150 pages. Um, our data files are massive. Um, you know, and, and anybody can go access those um, at fcx.com forward slash uh, sustainability. And you know, we're just we're in this time now where it's really important to be transparent and to provide data externally so that stakeholders and shareholders and um, investors have the ability to really um, you know, judge for those, themselves how we're uh, doing on ESG and sustainability. Um, the copper mark, I mentioned this, many of you know what it is um, already, so I won't spend too much time on that, but it is an assurance framework that was originally developed by the International Copper Association and is now uh, in a, um, an independent not-for-profit organization managed out of uh, the UK. It is really um, something that we feel is really important. It's extremely important to have third-party validation of what we're doing on ESG. Um, and the copper mark covers 32 ESG issues. It is aligned with the Responsible Minerals Initiative's Risk Readiness Assessment uh, platform. And, and ultimately, you know, we think it's extremely important that we as an industry do the work to move the middle. And what I mean by that is, is not just develop elite schemes, but really develop standards that the bulk of the industry can get into and then use to help them drive continual improvement over time, whether that be on climate, whether that be on human rights or any of the other multitude of, of ESG or sustainability issues. You'll see here, we've, we've committed to copper market, all of our copper sites. Um, we've already achieved it at, at many, at nine. Uh, we have two more that are pending, Safford and Cerita, that we've got letters of commitment for. Those should be announced soon. And then uh, we're starting the process for Grassberg operations this year. Very pleased to say that. I don't need to tell you this, I don't think, because our last presenter did a fantastic job of explaining to you, you know, the demand that's going to come for copper and also for our molybdenum as well. Uh, molybdenum, molyb, molybdenum, I'm sorry, is used in high strength steels and many different renewables applications. So we're, we're bound to see, you know, significant amount of, amounts of growth in, in both. Um, you know, copper ultimately, you know, we have to make sure all this extra demand, you know, doesn't come at a cost to sustainability. And we believe that very strongly at Freeport. You know, we, we don't, we, we take that, that commitment and that obligation to produce that additional copper responsibly. Um, and we think that's really important, you know, that you know, we've got all of these battery metals that are so important and all these uh, minerals that are so important to the energy transition. We have to be careful that we don't erode other issues. So by focusing so much on climate that we don't have things happen like, like human rights issues, like uh, water issues, biodiversity, um, you know, we really need to make sure that we don't, um, you know, just address the transition with additional demand that's not well thought through and that does not manage its risks well or that doesn't come along with well-managed risks. So our climate strategy, um, you know, in 2020, we produced our first uh, standalone climate report. We also put forth our first target, which is a 15% reduction on a 2018 baseline by 2030. It's an intensity target for our America's operations. So what does that mean? It's a per ton of copper uh, cathode uh, target. It's not an absolute target. And the reason for that is to enable growth, because again, as we sort of look, you know, as the last speaker set up really well, as we look to the next eight years or so, the demands are significant, 
especially on existing assets. So organic growth, as we would call it, you know, where you have an existing mine and, and you're trying to expand it um, as opposed to, you know, a whole new mine, which, uh, you know, really, honestly, we can't underpin the difficulties and the complexities of that right now. So really, we need to be able to grow. Um, but we know that on a per ton basis, we need to do that better and better and better. Um, and so we have the 15% target. We also committed to the task force on climate related financial disclosures, which is an important transparency framework. Really, it's the leading framework globally for reporting on climate. Um, and we committed to aligning our disclosures with it and are in the process of, of finishing that up. Um, last year, we announced our uh, new target for PTFI, so for Grassberg operations, and that one is a 30% reduction per ton of payable copper. Um, you know, there's a little bit further to go at PTFI because it is primarily coal-based, um, you know, and it, it's a really interesting story, and I'll give you some examples from, from there in, in a few minutes here. Um, you know, we also, um, you know, really worked hard to complete a global scenario analysis. I'll talk to you a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, and we committed to going through the science-based targets initiative for our, our targets, and, and we'll be starting that process later this year. Ultimately, our strategy is based around three pillars, reduction, resilience, and contribution. Reduction is all about what it says. So, you know, re reducing our, our footprint globally. Um, resilience is all about how do we prepare ourselves for the severity of risks that, that could come along with, and also opportunities really from a, a copper and molybdenum perspective um, with climate and, and change in the long term, and then contribution. So really, again, this idea that anywhere we produce copper, we should be, we should have the copper mark, we should be providing transparent um, information externally that is vetted by a third party, um, and really, you know, all those extra tons that we're producing should, should be done responsibly. Just a bit of an update. I'm not going to go into our data too deeply. Um, again, we just released our annual report on sustainability for 2021. You can go look at it. Like I said, fcx.com forward slash uh, sustainability. All our disclosures are there. Uh, we put out several nowadays. <laughs> um, and it includes our data file. So you can go in and see scope one and two emissions for every single site we operate globally. Um, I will say, you know, our um, our profile essentially, you know, if you just look at scope one and scope two, uh, scope one, of course, are direct emissions, scope two are indirect. We tend to be on the global, if you look at us globally, about, you know, we bounce around 50 50. Uh, but what we're seeing is our scope two emissions as grids are, are greening, as we're securing our own renewables uh, in, the, in the power we purchase, we see that coming down and we see the scope one share going up. Um, and that will naturally happen with time right as we um as you know basically scope two becomes hopefully lower and lower and lower carbon um scope three you know we're still working on that it's a challenge to estimate other organizations emissions um you know but it's something we take very seriously we will have a an updated climate report out sometime here in the next few months um, that will provide a more fulsome update um, but, you know, as a copper producer, we don't tend to have the downstream challenges of many of the other metals um, in downstream, um, you know, basically smelting, refining, and then uh, production forms of copper, whether that be bar, rod, wire, or even the cables. Um, you know, it's just not nearly as energy intensive to, to produce copper. Um, but, you know, we have, we have upstream scope three emissions, just like any other miner. Um, so we're working on that, um, and, and we're also working on just trying to understand our customers' emissions as well, um, and we'll have a more, more fulsome update on that soon. And then also, pleasantly, uh, you know, we've, you know, our 20, it's a, there's a highlight up here, our 2021 absolute greenhouse gas emissions, so just for scopes one and two, we're 12% lower than 2018 levels, um, which is, you know, great. We're, you know, happy to see that and to say that, you know, in a year where production increased significantly, of course, with the sort of recovery from COVID that we um, still managed to not have a commensurate increase in emissions. Um, and so there's more about that in, that in the sustainability report. And then of course, in our upcoming climate report, we'll explain that further. Our long-term decarbonization plan, um, every major miner has one of these now. I mean, it's basically a roadmap. 
uh, without really knowing exactly how we're going to do exactly what we want to do. Um, I will say there's a lot of uh, a lot more clarity in the next eight years uh, to get to 2030 than there is beyond 2030. But that's why we develop these roadmaps and we make investments and we try to collaborate across industry. So what you see here, of course, is that we we aspire to net zero, um, and and really, you know, these arrows give you an indication of where we think the biggest, um, or at least where the the contributions from these main levers that we've identified um, will be. So, you know, from now until 2030, the next seven and a half years or so, we know much of it will come from all of the work that we're doing on renewables um, to secure PPAs um, and make investments in PPAs to, to secure that energy, uh, you know, low carbon energy for our sites. Um, we've already seen that starting to make an improvement in our, uh, in our data. Um, equipment electrification, of course. Um, there is no such thing currently as a zero emission haul truck. There is now Anglo uh, announced last week. They have their hydrogen truck um, being tested at a site, which is fantastic. We've, we've joined several uh, collaborations and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, but equipment electrification is super important. Um, it's something that you know, we know we need to do, um, not just for haul trucks, but for ancillary equipment as well. Um, energy and asset efficiency. This is really, honestly, you know, we've always really focused on this, and and I know the next um, the next conversation is about AI, artificial intelligence. You know, ultimately, we have several programs um, where, you know, you you basically do this thing called a digital twin, where you you create a twin of your concentrator, let's say, um, and it enables kind of predictive. actual concentrator better um, and we've been doing that and then we also have this uh, program for haul truck predictive analytics as well and those have actually you know <laughs> improved energy efficiency they've improved how we run our equipment um, you know and we'll continue to do that work over time uh, process innovation we have some pretty cool things that we're doing right now to try to uh, you know really improve uh, leaching, can we do it more efficiently? Can we make some step changes um, in that? And so some really cool things that we're doing around um, process innovation. And again, there's more about that in our report. Now to give you some more specifics, um, equipment electrification. So um, we are working very closely with our uh, Caterpillar and Komatsu, uh, you know, basically with our vendors and other OEMs to try to work together to understand, okay, what do we need to do? How are we going to do it? You know, it's not just this magical electric haul truck is going to show up and we're going to do things exactly the same. I think that, you know, anybody who thinks that you're just going to duplicate the existing mine by swapping in and out haul trucks, um, you know, that wouldn't really be innovation. <laughs> I mean, it'd be in innovation, obviously, for the haul truck itself, and it'd be innovation because you have to power it. But really, it's a great opportunity to do things differently. So what can we do differently? Um, how do we combat, um, you know, declining ore grades, larger pits, you know, how do we do that? Um, it's a great opportunity. So it's actually leading to a lot more collaboration and partnership um, than ever before. Um, we've, uh, we're also trialing both the Komatsu and Caterpillar 400 ton ultra class uh, diesel electric trucks at Cerro Verde to try to see, um, you know, how they, they operate in our conditions and, and to really look at what might set us up for the future. Both of those options um, can be fully electric once that technology is available. Um, and then, you know, we're, this is the era of collaboration as what I often call it. We are, um, we, we're a patron supporter of the Charge on Innovation Challenge, which I think some of you probably um, have joined, which is great. You know, let's solve these problems together. It's a great um, consortium that's been started um, out of actually Australia um, by our peers. And so we're really glad to be a part of that. There's ICMM's Cleaner Safer Vehicles Initiative. And then the, we joined two H2 hydrogen um, uh, consortiums, one in Chile and one in Peru. You know, Chile is really trying to advance hydrogen. Um, and so, you know, we're watching that very closely and, and really collaborating through these consortiums to see when and where we can, you know, participate in pilots and trials. Um, and so ultimately, um, you know, from a, uh, a haul truck perspective, you know, and ancillary equipment, it's, it's about working together, whether you're working with your peers or, or we're working directly with our vendors to try to figure out the right approach. Um, and I'll just sort of underpin that 
um, you know, this whole process isn't going to be without cost. And so we heard from our previous speaker at Janus, you know, we can't just, you know, okay, so now there's an electric call truck available. We can't just magically, you know, order 460 or whatever our current fleet is. We have one of the largest call truck fleets uh, globally. And then they show up at the door, right? You know, there's, there's costs associated with being first mover. There's costs associated with waiting in line, because if we all want it at the same time, that's going to be a challenge. And then, like I said before, there's just this idea that we may do things a little bit differently. And so what does that look like? And how do we then make the investment over time in a way um, that doesn't undercut uh, significantly the profitability? All right, let me keep going here, sorry. Okay, innovation and electric electrification. So it's not just about haul trucks. What about Grassberg? Grassberg is now uh, fully underground, which is um, really quite a marvel. Very, ex I'm excited I got to go in a few weeks and go see this amazing uh, transformation that they've done from open pit to underground. Um, it is uh, really, it's the largest block caving operation in the world um, as part of it we designed and built this really um, cool, I think it's cool, but I'm a mining nerd, um, autonomous electric train system to move ore through the, the system and move ore through uh, the underground and then over and up to the mill um, instead of traditional underground uh, diesel powered equipment. Uh, the train is significant. It carries around 300 metric tons of ore per trip. So that's the equivalent of about one surface haul truck um, they're fully autonomous. They drive themselves uh, to and from loading chutes um, and unloading stations. And then the ore cars can be loaded remotely by operations in a surface control room. Um, and so this results in a, a decent reduction, um, not only for the mine in of itself, but also versus uh, being in an open pit. Um, and we'll likely, you know, we're looking at other opportunities to electrify other equipment in the underground as well as time goes on. Our climate scenario analysis, you know, this is something that's really important for all uh, companies, really, to look out uh, to the future, to look at different scenarios, you know, where, where's the world going to be potentially, and then to try to model and understand, basically identify what might the significant transition or physical risks and opportunities be as an organization. This is a requirement of TCFD, um, and it's something that, you know, we also just think is, is, you know, it's a cornerstone of our resiliency uh, pillar within our strategy. Uh, transition risks, you know, uh, maybe I'll say a bit more about the scenarios. So the scenarios themselves look out to um, three options. There are many options in scenario analysis. You can look at probably 10 or more scenarios. We picked three. Uh, we wanted to look at a, a net zero, so one and a half degree, that's the green box. We wanted to look at a moderate one, and we also wanted to look at current state. So what if the world really doesn't move off where it is right now? Um, you know, what will that look like? For us, in a nutshell, as a copper producer, um, you know, we can tell you that if it stays the way that it is, there will obviously be more uh, higher greenhouse gas emissions, and that, that will increase physical risk uh, for us at our, at our operations. It will for any company operating anywhere. Um, if there's aggressive climate action and, and we're all the way on the opposite end of the scale to one and a half degree, then we see more transition risk, um, you know, as we transition from the current, you know, really fossil fuel based economy into a uh, non fossil fuel based economy into a net zero economy um, in terms of supply chains, in terms of, you know, maybe having to substitute different uh, materials that we use. Um, and then, but ultimately the opportunities that it presents for us as a copper producer and a molybdenum producer are uh, fantastic. Um, you'll see this map is basically the outcome of the first round of our scenario analysis, which is at a global level, um, where we take these global climate models that are peer reviewed and externally uh, produced by third parties. We work with a, a consultant then to try to look at across these three scenarios, what are the potential physical risks for us? Ultimately, not surprisingly for us here in Arizona, uh, where I'm based, um, you know, we see wet extremes increasing, but water stress and heat also increasing. Um, what does that mean? That means that access to fresh water is, is, is going to become, uh, you know, more challenging than it already is. Uh, but it also means the frequency of storms and the intensity of storms is likely to increase. 
Um, and so that just means you need to do things like take a look at, you know, stormwater retention, tailings, impoundments, how do we manage significant amounts of water when we get it, um, which we already do, um, but, you know, we're taking a look out using these models in a much longer time frame now, right, 2050 and beyond to try to see, uh, are we, you know, truly prepared? Do we need to make some, some infrastructure uh, improvements? Uh, similarly, for our um, port-based facilities like Amama Par in, uh, for Grassburg and Papua, or for um, our facility at Atlantic Copper, just again, trying to understand what could sea level rise, you know, what, what could the risks uh, be with sea level rise and, and how we might, might we mitigate them with, again, infrastructure um, types of changes. So we're really going out across our business trying to understand that um, and trying to uh, get good data and information that's reliable um, and to bring it back to our site so that we can make improvements over time. Um, this has been, it's been an eye-opening process. You know, we already have done a lot um, in this area around resilience. We have to be resilient. We're in very uh, remote locations, um, but it's been, a, been a, a great process to really go through with a bit of a different lens than we've used in the past. Finally, uh, our sustainability reports, I've mentioned these a couple times already. Um, we produce a lot of them. <laughs> it feels like uh, we have about six or seven disclosures, at least that we do every year. Um, our annual report on sustainability that uh, I mentioned we just released in April um, is available. And then our, our climate report that we released last at the end of last September, uh, which covered 2020, but it also included the results of our scenario analysis, which we didn't conclude until in 2021. So there's plenty of relevant information in there. Um, if you're interested in it, we also produce, like I said, many other documents, modern slavery, uh, you know, voluntary principles reports, et cetera. Um, just invite you to go take a look at them. It sounds like my uh, there's an issue with the audio, so we're going to forego the Q&A, um, which is too bad, but uh, I would love to hear your questions, which we could also do through chat if you all wanted. Um, but um, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, I know that these virtual things can sometimes be a drag, but this one hopefully has been fun. And uh, thank you so much for, for having me and, and listening to more about Freeport. Thank you. Thanks, Andrea, uh, for your time. I'm not sure if you can hear us, so um, we may have to do a workaround for Q&A. We do have a few questions that have come through in the chat box, but what we might do is try and send them to you separately uh, and then share the responses uh, post-event. So again, thank you for your time and sharing your insights on the journey that Freeport is undertaking uh, as part of this decarbonisation process. So. So that draws to the end uh, of session three. So again, you need to log out of this session and then log back into session four. Um, so we'll just make that transition now and I'll see you all back uh, in a few seconds for the start of session four. So thanks very much and thanks again, Andrea.